And you put your last man. Yeah. And you freaks. You better get right with God. Just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. We have Hamas that thinks that the goal of civilians is to protect their weapons. ISIS has executed more than 700. This is ISIS. I want this so He wants to take over everything and he wants to come. I'm catching Middle Eastern people in the day. Today we want to close up uh, with another one of the principles that we want to talk about in terms of what humility looks like, in terms of what we're called to do and how to say what we're saying, okay? Now, we started this with the idea of looking at Jesus. Every week, we've looked at words that Jesus has given. How he did it, what did he do, how did he respond? And we wanted to give you a good definition, something we could consistently come back to. Because for a lot of us, humility is just one of those things that's, we don't understand it. If we do see it, it's false humility. It's thinking lower than yourself. It's this passive, you know, doormat of a personality. And, and, uh, and then you think if you, if you say anything at all, you're not being humble. You know, you're not, if you stand up for something, you're not being humble. But it's also not thinking more than yourself, all right? So we want to give you this definition. Humility is thinking and seeing yourself as you really are, all right? And this is what we see in the life and example of Jesus Christ, actually living out of who you really are, all right? Again, not thinking more than yourself. We talked about that over the last couple weeks, but we definitely want to make sure you knew this. It's not thinking less of yourself, right? It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking accurately, all right? So we don't want you to kind of put yourself down here and feel like you have nothing to say, all right? We want you to think accurately of who you are. And as we talked the last two weeks, we talked about, you know, who do we naturally tend to be? Well, in our culture, we naturally tend to be, especially as Christians, we allow the thing that we think separates us. We think that the truth is what separates us, but we allow what separates us and actually brings diversity in our culture to be divisive and to bring division in ways that it shouldn't, all right? And so I I put this conversation up here, this kind of better than attitude. Um, Our arrogance or our better than attitude is rooted and what we believe is true. Well, that's not what it says. That's what it says up there. We'll, we'll keep it up. But it's what we believe is true. We, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, this idea of letting the things that we believe are true, that we believe are true, argue against the things that other people believe are true, versus trying to live in the tension of all that is true. And in order to do that, you really have to be willing to let truth be challenged and let truth be tested so that it, become, it can not just be true, but it can be real. All right? And last week we talked about this idea, not just, not just that we don't approach this, this world with a better than attitude and think that what separates us apart. We also want to be careful how we respond, especially when we respond in anger. Because for most of us, we, we just think accurately who we are. We get really offended and defensive when somebody attacks us personally, judges us, or accuses us. And we looked at the life of Jesus Christ and he didn't do any of that. Now, he did get angry. Anger is not the problem. The problem is this responding in anger, this responding in judgment, all right, if you will, this judgment that we sort of naturally live from. And the reason that that's there, we we said this, we said how we deal with our own hypocrisy, our inconsistency and our brokenness, that is really what dictates our response when we feel challenged, judged, or accused. It's really shining, when we feel judged, it's really shining a light on us. And the way we respond in anger most of the time is because we just kind of get, you know, the hair on the back of your head stands up and you just, you just kind of go back after somebody and, and they said something, you took it personally and you took offense. And really this response again in anger comes from judgment and being judged. But the problem is, is that we're not really paying that much attention. When Jesus said, don't judge, deal with what you have to deal with. Deal with what's in your eye. Don't worry about the speck of dust in theirs. Deal with the log that's in yours. You have to deal with your brokenness, your inconsistency, and your hypocrisy if you want to live from a place where you actually are, if you want to live from a place of humility, really really speak from there. And so today I want to talk very specifically about what are we actually called to say, but we're going to come at it a little bit differently. So today's title is, I'm sorry for being silent. All right, I know I just spent three weeks talking about the fact that 
we obviously haven't been silent, right? We've, we've added to the noise of our culture, the noisy culture. We've just added more noise to it as we've engaged in conversation. And, and like I said, you know, some of the things that we discuss every day in terms of marriage equality and is, you know, are they born that way? And is it, is it really a sin? And isn't it antiquated thinking? And did everything in Genesis really happen? And we start all the, you know, depending on your family conversations and your coworker conversations, these are things we just get tense and in, involved in, especially when people are on the opposite side of the fence for us. We're really just opposing views. We live in that tension, and we don't like it. But for us, there's really something that we're called to say that I, I've been convinced that for most Christians, we, we've, sort of, we've sort of replaced what we've, we're called to say because we think we're supposed to say something else first. And I just want to talk about this today, really coming in a place of, for all of us, hopefully at the end of the day, we can, we can acknowledge it together that we've maybe, maybe we've been silent on some things. We've been silent in some areas we're supposed to be actively speaking about. And instead, we've been speaking about things that maybe we shouldn't initially be talking about. All right? So as we look at what Jesus has to say, I want to, before I do that, I want to I wanna give you an example today. I want to talk about a guy who knew Jesus pretty well. His name was Peter. Peter was one of his disciples. And Peter, just to give you a quick backstory for him, he, you know, he, he, Jesus found him fishing because that was his family trade. And he found him fishing and told him, come with me, follow me. We're going to be doing that in the next series. Just, you know, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And, and Peter was an passionate, eager guy. He kind of got in trouble all the time, sticking his foot in his mouth. Like, you know, he kept wanting to be involved and wanting to say things he didn't know anything about. That doesn't remind you of Christians at all. He wanted to say things all the time. He didn't really know what he's talking about. He just kept throwing things out there. I think Jesus called him Satan one time, like, you know, just rebuking him, like, calm down, you know. You don't know, you don't really even know what you're saying. And Peter was just, I mean, he loved Jesus and he loved what he knew was true in his heart. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But the problem is he put his hope in what he thought the Messiah meant. He put his hope in what he thought, what, how things were going to work out with the Messiah. And when Jesus was arrested and when Jesus was tried, he lost his hope. And he betrayed the man he loves. And he, he denied him, just like he said he, Jesus said he was going to do. And he left and he went back fishing and and he just was filled with hopelessness once again. And he's also the guy who, had, who stared at an empty tomb. He's also the guy that when Jesus showed back up on the same shore where he first saw them, he ran out and had breakfast with them. He's also the guy who when Jesus left and left the charge for what he was supposed to do, he preached the, the sermon at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came. He was a part of one of the greatest movements that happened from the Holy Spirit coming and active in, their, in the Jerusalem and watched the change of history begin to happen because of who Jesus is. He was a leader in the first church. He was one of the people that got to first witness to Gentiles. He, he was the first one to get his perspective changed that, hey, this isn't just going to be about Jews anymore. Peter has an amazing story. He has an amazing life, and he knew what it was like, especially in this first early century of, of, of Christianity. He knew what it was like to live for Christ, and he knew what it was like to live for Christ when it was tense, when you had to suffer, when you really had to, had to go against opposing views, completely different opposing views. He knew what it was like to suffer death because of his beliefs and because of who Jesus is. And so when he wrote a couple of letters, he wrote some things to the church to give them some instruction. They did, he didn't have a creative team like I do. It was real simple. They just called it First and Second Peter. That's all they did. If we had, he had a creative team like me, it would have been really cool, really cool names, right? But it was First and Second Peter. And in First Peter, one of the letters he wrote, he, he talked a lot about what it was like to live as children of God, to talk about, to talk to really a lot about what it looked like to live passionately after God and after Christ. But in 1 Peter 3, as he addresses husbands and wives, he kind of quickly addresses Christian husband and wives, and then he addresses all the church. He addresses all Christians, and he starts talking about what does it look like to live this life, this called life as a Christian, when it's tense, when there's suffering, when there's opposition. And this is what he says in 1 Peter 3. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. He just, this is a statement from an earlier verse where he's talking about, you know, you know I know it's going to be hard, but you need to remember, you need to, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Remember who Jesus is. And then he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. This is just Peter telling all the church, like, look, you're going to need to have, you're going to need to be prepared, people. It's going to be tough. You're going to need to be prepared 
to have an answer for the reason of the hope that you have. Now, this is funny because if you, were, if you were raised in the church like I was raised in the church, this verse was often read, but what was taught outside of this verse was something a little bit different. What was taught to me growing up in the church was that I honestly needed to, to really work hard, and, and they had all verses, work hard to show thyself, study thyself, show, approved unto God. Like There's all sorts of reasons, but I, I was sort of taught that I needed to have an answer and be prepared to have an answer for all of the issues in life. I needed to be prepared personally to have an answer for the problems that people have with the church, with Christ, and with God. I needed to be prepared to defend the truth and to defend the Bible. And that's not what Peter is saying. I want you to just pick out these words. He says, be prepared, which means you need to have intentional steps to know, to be able to have an answer, something you can answer someone for the question that they're asking. To everyone who asks the reason, this is what they're asking. They're asking why. The reason is the why in your life. The reason for what? The reason for the hope. He says, you need to be prepared to have an answer for for the why you're so confident. The hope, why you're so, you have assurance in this. The hope, why, not just, you know, again, not the way the world uses the word hope, like wishful thinking. Hope meaning absolute hope. Why you have a hope. Why do you feel so secure? And then he says that you have, meaning personally. Be prepared to be able to answer that for what you personally have. And that's an interesting thing because, again, for us, if you raise anything like me, that's not exactly how I was raised. I was raised with a, a very defensive attitude that I had, to, I had to defend the truth. I had to defend the Bible. I had to defend what I believed. That's what I thought I had to do. And here's the problem with that. We talked about it a couple weeks ago in terms of truth. Is that truth, just because truth is challenged, doesn't make it any less true or more true. Just because it's challenged by an opposing thought or an opposing thing, it doesn't make, it doesn't really ever shake the foundation of what's true. And let me just tell you something. If your religion is based on how well you can defend the truth, that's a sucky religion, okay? Let me just say it out. Let me call it what it is. If your religion and your set of beliefs is dependent upon how well you can defend it, you need to bail on that religion. Because truth is, is not any less true when it's challenged. It becomes real when it's tested and stretched. That's when you know it's true. Let me just, you didn't even pay for this. This is extra. Let me just give you the side note, okay? Side note. Most people that I meet that are extraordinarily in this defensive posture, okay? They know about six to eight verses about the love of God. They know a couple dozen verses about what God hates and what is wrong. And they don't know anything else, okay? They don't know Jack. And most of the people that I know that have invested significant time and energy into really learning and really pouring into the heart and character of God, those are the people that don't feel the need to defend anything. Those are the people in my life that aren't that concerned because this was around before they were and it will be around after they're gone. And it's gonna be true It was true, it is true, and it's going to be true long after they're busy trying to defend something. There were some of the most humble people I know, the ones that really know this. So I'm just giving this to you. Don't, look, don't try to defend something that you don't really know, all right? Just stop. I don't care how many verses you memorized in vacation Bible school as a kid that aligns with what you think your thinking should be like. Stop taking a defensive posture for something, for a book you don't read that much, you, you need to be in the place where you are prepared to answer the hope, the why of the confidence that you personally have. Not some sort of, don't be prepared to answer what you think is true and not true. Be prepared to answer why. Why do you? Why do you think differently? Why do you have a confidence that's different? Now, if you went to Peter and said, Peter, why do you, where's your hope come from? I mean, Peter didn't have a Bible. Peter didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a whole system. Matter of fact, his system of beliefs and set of rules that he had, Jesus came and told him, yeah, it's not so much like that, right? He sort of kind of went in and destroyed what he had grown up actually believing 
He sort of brought in and gave it to fullness and fruition. He said, you know, there's nothing that's wrong, but it's got the wrong motive. It's got the wrong heart. It brings, it breeds division. I'm here to tell you how it's supposed to fully work. And so gee, if Peter was asked, Where, where's your hope? Like if you had to answer the reason for the hope that you have, what is it? I believe this is what Peter would say. My hope is in the resurrection. My hope is the fact that Jesus died. I, I saw him. And then a few days later, I had breakfast with him, right? There's my hope. Like, that's it. Like, you know, and you've, you've probably heard me say it before, when a guy can call it, you know, he can call his own death and resurrection, doesn't really matter anymore. I'm with him, right? I'm with that guy. And so his hope isn't in a system of what he believes. This isn't his, like, his little manual of, of beliefs and do's and don'ts. His, system, his, his whole hope is based on the fact that there's a risen Christ and he's experienced the Holy Spirit. He's experienced what Jesus said was going to happen. He said Jesus was going to come live in him and empower him. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter, he says this a few different places. He says, you know, in his great mercy, this is Jesus has given us a new birth. You know, you've heard this maybe born again language that Christians use. A new birth into what? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter has it really simple. That's where my hope is. That's what hope means to me. A little bit later on, he says, through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So now your faith and hope are in God. So it's not just Jesus. It's the whole Godhead. It's this idea, well, he raised him from the dead. So now your faith and hope rest in him. That's what he would say. And even though he said this, even though this is Peter's words, I mean, he had all that he needed to say, look, Jesus is alive. I saw him. I don't even need to explain anything else to you. When he approaches the church and says, look, sh be prepared to share the reason, the why behind the confidence, the hope that you personally have, he follows it up with these words. But do this, read the word with me, do this with? Ooh, well, one more time. But do this with? Gentleness, humility, and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Leave that up for just a few minutes. Here, here's Peter who has all the reason in the world to be cocky, right? He saw Christ risen from the dead. He doesn't need to explain anything to anybody, right? He could have just said, yeah, here's the selfie of me and him on the beach. Boom, you know, like done. That's all I got to do. But even as he charges Christians, these new followers of Christ, he looks at them and says, look, you, you need to have this answer of the hope of the why in you, but do it with gentleness. Do it with gentleness. This was not the case for them at this time, but we've seen it in our culture. This is just a very cultural, natural drift. Anytime that you feel like you have a majority, you begin to speak with an authority you don't really have. And that's one of the problems in our current culture is that if we can just get enough of a majority agreeing about what is true, then that truth becomes the authority and it can so easily shift from one thing to another, which means it's not true. So every culture has this. Isn't it just Christianity? But when you, begin to, when you feel like you have a majority, you speak with an authority that you think you've been given and you begin to sort of ramrod that over people and just run that all over people and disrespect people. There's no gentleness about that for you. This happens in everything. And respect is a big deal. He, he's telling people to respect the Romans. The Romans who could, they couldn't be any further away in their belief, entire belief system than a Christian. And he says, you need to do it with respect. You need to do it with respect. Listen, your coworkers, your family, the people you engage with, look, nobody believes something without good reason. Okay? Stop, stop pretending that people just, if they were only logical or did any investigation at all, that they would obviously agree with you, okay? Respect those people that God made and loves. Respect them. Now, they may not, they may not agree with you. They may have a completely different set of belief systems. They don't believe that for no reason. They're not ignorant. Stop asking people to become Christians by checking their brain at the door. That's not what we're called to do with gentleness, with respect, with a clear conscience. Do not be live, don't live a life that is completely contrary to what you say you believe. 
This is what we talked about last week. You got to be honest about your own hypocrisy and inconsistency and brokenness. But you need to be living a life. Okay, I'm living a life of this with a clear conscience. I'm not trying to do anything in my life that's going to take away from the testimony of the things that I say I believe. Why? So that when I'm living out that good behavior, those who would be critical would really ultimately be ashamed. I mean, you think about it as a young adult, you know, you went out and maybe you were trying to make good decisions as a Christian and you would go to the bar and you decided to have a drink or two, but you wouldn't get drunk with everybody else. Those people didn't look at you with admiration. Your friends didn't go, oh, thank you for making such great decisions. Thank you so much for being wise. No, they were critical of you because your good choices, your good behavior always shines light on them. It always convicts them. So this is the idea that Peter says, look, your behavior itself, the way in which you live is going to make a massive difference when people have a criticism against you or, 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 or slanderous against you. It's going to make them ashamed. It's, going to, it's really going to convict their hearts. They're not going to say anything to you about it. But that's what you're called to do. And this is what Peter would have remembered. Okay, Peter would have wrote, he would have written all this down, but Peter would have remembered Jesus' words. When Jesus looked at them, when he looked at them and said this in Matthew 5, he said, is that my next word? Yeah. You are the light of the world. That's what he would have remembered. He would have remembered Jesus looking at them in the crowd saying, hey, guess what? You're the light of the world. You are. Like on a, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, no one then hides, you know, he gets logical. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Remember, he's like, right, that's dumb. He said a stand of lamp is given a stand where it sits to light everyone in the house so everyone can enjoy it. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Peter would have remembered Jesus saying, hey, remember in the, when it's tight? Remember in the tension? Remember in the conversation with somebody who doesn't agree with you? Remember in those moments? You're the light of the world. Remember that. And just like that light is meant to be up on a hill, attracting visitors from far off lands, the, the, the light is an attraction. It's a safety. Just like you're supposed to be a light to those every, so that everyone gets to benefit from you. Just like that, live a life that's gentle and respectful. When you say what you have to say, when you finally speak up, do it in such a way. Do the, say the right thing, but also say it in such a way that would go along with your behavior, that would go along with a clear conscience. And then people are going to see it. And even their criticism they're going to be ashamed of. Just like that, just like your good deeds, your light would be seen and people would glorify your father in heaven. That's what it's going to look like when you begin to become the light that he's called you to be. Now, here's what happens. When we begin to live out this in the tension of our lives, in the tension of our culture, and we begin to have conversations, we, we really have really substituted this whole idea that, we, that the Christian response is no longer tell me about your hope, but instead answer all my issues. Settle this problem I have with Jesus. Settle this problem I have with the church first. And we're called to be the light. You're the light of the world in that moment. And the problem is when we substitute those two things, again, we have no choice but to begin to argue and take a defensive posture and try to prove our rightness in that moment. We have no choice. When we substitute what we've actually been called to say for, let me, let me, let me answer all of your issues first. Let me answer your criticism first. And that is, that is, I'm telling you, that is not, that is not the call of what we're supposed to say and supposed to do. Not with a watching world, not with an outside world who's living in, like I said last week, living in the darkness without hope. You know, don't go right to, it's not about behaviors or, or beliefs in, the, in, in what is true and not true. It has nothing to do with that. He said, I want the example to be you. You're the light of the world. Now, the problem with light is, again, we ta we've taken something that Jesus called us to be, and because we've substituted just explaining the reason for the hope that we personally have, we've then taken the light, and we've had felt like we've had to not only use the light as truth, but defend it and argue it, and we turn the light into a flamethrower. 
right? We, we add the fuel of our own pride and our own righteousness and our own defense mechanism and our own accusations. We fuel it and we turn the light into a flamethrower, okay? The light's supposed to draw. The light does two things. The light exposes the darkness and the things in the darkness that don't want the light will flee. That's okay. But this picture, the light really is something that draws and attracts, just like Jesus' life. Jesus' life was that life. But a flamethrower, I really want, listen, I asked the creative team for a flamethrower today. And they're smarter than me and they wouldn't let me have one, okay? Really wanted it for a demonstration. I wanted you to just see that a flamethrower is this, if you've never seen a picture of one, it is, this, it is this thing that leaves nothing but destruction and irreversible devastation in the wake. Okay, and they're not accurate at all, right? It's not like, it's not like we're gonna have a conversation about homosexuality and I'm gonna, you know, use this in a flamethrower and just hit that target, I'm going to burn your entire house down. That's what we do. We think our response that's fueled by this defense of, I got to defend what's true, and if I don't defend what's true, they're going to think it's not true. And we take the light that we've been given and we turn it into a flamethrower, and we leave, nothing but we leave nothing but destruction in our wake. No wonder. No wonder people are, are looking at Christians and saying, they don't have anything to say that I want to hear. Because every time I talk to one, they're a flamethrower. Every time I have a discussion about this, they're a flamethrower. When what we're actually called to say, be prepared to have an answer. For the why behind the confidence and the hope that you personally have. He didn't say you're the, you're the defense of truth to the world. He didn't say, you're the defense of what's right to the world. He said, you're the light. You, your changed life is the light to the world. Don't worry about defending what, you, what has changed your life, what, you know, the truth and the, the call of God on your life as a Christian. You are the light. You are the door. You are the thing, you are the thing that's going to draw people to me. It's you. It's your changed life. It's, your, it's the way in which it lives out of your life. Because let's face it, a selfless, generous, compassionate life and compassionate living, it is above reproach, right? No one's angry with these people. A completely selfish per selfless person, giving of themselves, generously giving all they have to others in need, compassionate, something that pours out of their heart, compassionate for those that no one else would be compassionate about. Nobody has issues with these people. Okay, people might, they might not ever agree with you. They might not ever go, you know what? You're right. You know, you're right and I'm wrong. I should have thought better, you know? They might look, hey, I don't agree with them at all. But I, have, I can't say anything about them. Look at the way they live. Completely selfless, generous, gentle, respectful, compassionate, living out their life and their behavior with a clear conscience in their life. They are the light their transformed life is the light. I mean, I, I, I don't agree with them, but they're good people. We need more of people like them in, the, in this world. I want my daughter to marry one of them. I want to hire people like that. This is a life above reproach that we're talking about. Not just what we're called to say, but how we're called to say it with humility with gentleness, with grace. And, uh, yeah, I can say so much more about that. I, I laugh because I, I really do think that in many, many circles, in many, many circles of faith, they really, really do believe that being a flamethrower is the answer. And I wish, I wish they could so clearly see I wish they could so clearly see the devastation in the wake of their actions. And I wish that more followers of Christ would simply be the light, allow their transformed life and the humbleness and humility in, how they, in what they say to be the thing that people go, I'm willing to listen to what you believe because I now get a better picture of why you believe it. And this is really the question. 
Why do you believe? Now, understand that when you're in these conversations, this is not what they're saying. The, their lips are saying, how could you believe that people aren't born gay? There's all these, you know, tests and genetics, and that's, this is what the mouth is doing, right? But what they're really saying is, why do you believe differently? Why don't you believe that? Why do you believe blank? They're, they know you're a Christian. They assume your answer. Why do you believe that? Why do you believe and I don't think that our answer should be honestly any different than Peter's. I believe we should say what our hope is, and our hope is in the resurrection. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm a changed life. I'm a changed life because Jesus is alive and he's living in me. That's, that's what's different. My hope, just like Peter, my hope is not in a system of rules or beliefs that come from a, a Bible that I believe is true. That's not where my hope is. My hope is not in, the, in how well I can defend it. My hope for the life that's changed in me is based on the resurrection. It is the foundation of our faith. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians. When you want to get down to the nitty gritty, Paul says this, 1 Corinthians. Cacow. There we go, Okay. <laughs> If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. You want to talk about essentials of the faith? Paul says, essential. If Christ has not been raised, if there's no resurrection, pretty much everything else fails. So that's our hope. Our hope, when we're in these conversations, when we're living in the tension of responding to this world, trying to do it accurately who we are, thinking and seeing ourselves as we actually are. We want to do this with gentleness, respect, compassion, selfless, with humility. We want to make sure that people hear first and foremost the reason for the hope that we personally have. Here's a sentence. Here's just a statement. I believe that Jesus died for my sin, rose from the dead, and lives in me. All of my hope is in Jesus. Yeah, but Matt, what about, what about, I mean, how can you believe that homosexuality is a sin? Why can you, why do you prescribe to this old, antiquated, you know, document and doctrine? I, I know, I know there's, I, look, I know there's questions to be answered there. I understand what the Bible says. I've, I've already told you what the Bible says. But here's, listen, before you, before we talk about this, before I say anything else, I need you to know this. I believe that Jesus died for, for my sin. You don't understand how broken I am. You don't understand what a mess my life is. I believe he died for me. And I believe he rose again and he lives in me. So you know what? All my hope is in Jesus. All of it. It's not in whether or not we agree about this thing. It's not in whether or not you, you, know, you walk away and, 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 and feel better about the argument. I'm just letting you know, all of my hope is in him. Yeah, but Matt, what about ISIS and what about the, the evil in this world? How could God allow such horrible things to happen? Why are Christians being persecuted and beheaded? And why, you know what, I know, I, you know what, I know. And I, I can probably take you through some things, but I want you to know, first and foremost, mom, coworker, brother, Uncle Ted, I want you to know that I believe, I believe Jesus died for my sin, for me. And he, and he rose from the dead and he lives in me. So, so I don't really always know the answers, but I'm telling you, all of my hope is in Jesus. All of it. Yeah, but what about the Bible? What about the things that, I mean, I have a hard time swallowing half the junk in Genesis. Like, it's just hard. Like, I have a hard time believing. Do I really have to believe an ax head floated in the water? Like, that just sounds dumb. Do I really have to believe all of these things? You know what? I, you know what? I know. I, and I can tell you that I believe these things, but, but I, want, I just want you to hear from me. Why I believe. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead and I believe he lives in me. So all of my hope is in Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, if, if this is the thing that you say, some conversation will just stop. Some conversation will stop because the word of God is, is, is it's a sweet aroma to some and it's the stench of death to others. And that's okay. Okay? But we don't want to use scripture like weapons. We're not, we are not interested in flamethrower Christianity. We want to be the light of the changed life and the hope that I have 
Because all my hope's in Christ because of what he's done for me. So it's all there. And when we begin to walk down this path, we begin to walk down this path that says, okay, but Matt, if I do this next Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving with Uncle Tim, that's not going to solve anything. It's not going to fix anything. It's not going to shut him up. Look, it might not. It might not. But this is what you're called to say. And for many of us, this is what we have been silent about for far too long. And we thought that the answer was arguing with them about what was right or true. But it needs to start. When Jesus said, when Jesus said, hey guys, I'm the way. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You don't get to go anywhere except through me. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Right? It's me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can't explain another way. You can't behave another way to get there. It's through me. I'm the way. And so I'm telling you, no matter what your conversation is, when you start with what you're called to say, the Holy Spirit will cause that conversation to go differently. Look, you know what? You just threw this thing at me. I mean, sometimes I'll have conversations with people, and I'm telling you, I've I've been doing this for a while, but see, people still ask me questions, and I go like, where did that come from? Holy cow. Like right out of left field, right? I didn't even know that was even a belief. When people throw me off kilter or throw me off balance or I get into an issue where I'm, I, it's, a one, it's one more time. It's one more time I have to talk about, are people really born this way? I have to engage in that conversation all the time. And every time I do, I think through, okay, am I really supposed to defend this and argue this and make my point and really flamethrower this thing to death? Or do I need to make sure that regardless of anything else that's said, that I'm prepared to be able to answer for them Look, I I believe Jesus died for me. And and I believe he rose from the dead. And now he lives in me. And all my hope is in Jesus. And not just for the people that you're arguing with, but I'm telling you, when you start the conversation that way, your path to humbly engaging the rest of that conversation is a whole lot better. Your path of changing you and your tone and your attitude is a whole lot better too when you start here. When you start with what you're called to say, but we have been silent far too long. Just adding to the noise of an already noisy argument when we're called to be the light. To humble in humility, to think and see as we actually are and humbly point others to absolute hope. Here's what I want you to do. Let's read this very quickly. Go back to the, uh, the I believe statement. I just want to read it together, okay? And listen, just in case you're not a Christian, you can say these words. I'm not trying to trick you, okay? It doesn't work that way, all right? I don't, I don't know what the Baptist told you, but it doesn't work that way, all right? Your, your heart has to be trans- you believe it, okay? Let's just say these words together. Everybody can say it. I just want you to practice speaking these words. Read, read, read it together. I believe that Jesus died for my sin rose from the dead and lives in me. All my hope is in Jesus. Let's just one more time. Let's read it again. I believe that Jesus died for my sin, rose from the dead, and now lives in me. All of my hope is in Jesus. One more time. One more time. Ready? I believe that Jesus died for my sin, and he rose from the dead, and he lives in me. All of my hope is in Jesus. I'm telling you, this is going to change everything for you. If you can simply have an answer for the reason you're confident personally. Now, you may not know. I mean, you may be like, Matt, I don't really know the answer to some of those questions you're asking. That's okay. That's a part of you growing in your relationship with Christ. That's a part of learning more about what God's word says. It's a part of growing in your understanding of God. Let the Holy Spirit do a work in you. That's fine. Don't feel the need to defend it. That's fine. But you need to have an answer 
for everyone as to why you believe differently. And it's not because one is right and one is wrong. I mean, oftentimes that's the case. But there's, sometimes there's the tension of both truths. You need to have an answer because that's what you've been called to have. That's what you've been called to say. And you need to let your changed life be the light, be the thing that God uses to point people to go through Jesus first. And then you know what? Behavior, theology, they might spend the rest of their life trying to figure out what's right and wrong. That's fine. Jesus said it's fine. But you got to go through me first. I'm the, Jesus has said I'm the one who transforms. It's not, your, it's not the, how good you talk about it. It's not how good you think about it. It doesn't have to do with your behavior. Stop, let's stop trying to perf- help people before, really behave and perform better to heaven. It's about going through him first. And if we don't start it there, we don't start the conversation there, then we've been silent far too long on the most important thing that we're called to say. All right? Let's pray. And then we might uh, read this one more time. <laughs> Thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you for your word. Thank you for how you lived and worked through Peter. God, just the way in which it challenges us and transforms us and really just calls us out to be living those lives with clear conscience but with gentleness and respect and humility and selfless with compassion. God, that that you really wanted not the truth, not just this silo of what is true and isn't true. God, we believe in your truth. But you wanted us, you wanted to work through us, through the changed lives in which you're working in us every day, how you're dealing with our hypocrisy and inconsistency and brokenness. You wanted that to be the light. You wanted that to be the thing that would give people the opportunity to experience the absolute hope that comes through Jesus alone. God, may we just confess to you that we have been silent on this for far too long. We've simply added to the noise instead of being the light. May you just break our hearts. May we leave here today changed, different, challenged, encouraged, that there is an answer that we can be prepared to have and give. And God, may that just change future conversations, future arguments, future potential devastation in people's relationships, when we start with you, Jesus, who said it started with you to begin with. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for this amazing day. In your name, Jesus, amen. We hope you've enjoyed engaging in our worship experience. Everything we do at Journey is to help make a difference in people's lives. If God has been moving and working in your life, we would love to hear your story. You can share it with us at mystory at thejourneyonline.com. If you would like to invest in the ministry and mission at Journey Church, you can give online at thejourneyonline.com. Thank you for investing in the lives that are changing at Journey Church.